September of 1968, I and all the other sixth graders entered school. Little did I know that my teachers had been working with professors of education at that time in Northwestern University who were all very concerned about educating us for the 21st century. They were working with schools of education around the country, and I entered the first global education experiment, uh, not really knowing what I was in for. And so as we entered school, by the time we got there, our teacher said to us, welcome. Now you have to take responsibility for your own learning, because we've been studying the future as best we can, and we're trying to figure out what's going to be useful to you. Uh, we've been tracking trends and patterns. Um, what we know is that our, your future will be characterized by more and more rapid change, more and more complexity and interdependence, more and more diversity, more and more uncertainty. There'll be big global issues you have to deal with. We need you to track the state of the planet data uh, because trends and patterns will be happening beyond and, and not casually observable, so you're going to have to keep your eye on the data. Uh, that's what we think we know. We don't know anything else. We don't know what kinds of jobs you're going to need. We don't know what kinds of technology. Whole careers will be invented before you're even 21. So what we think we can do for you is to teach you how to learn to learn, how to think about your thinking, and how to stay open-minded, because things are going to change really quickly, and you need to be there, and you need to be able to ad adjust and adapt. So I grew up to become a global educator, because that's what I thought was the edgiest, most forward-thinking thing there was. And then in 1987, the word sustainability arrived on the radar screen. And I thought, sustainability? I think I've been tracking unsustainability my whole life. What the heck is sustainability, and how do you educate for it? So I came home and told my father, I'm moving from global education to sustainability education. And my dad said, he was in advertising, and he said, ah, it'll never sell. <laughs> and of course, he was rarely wrong, and he wasn't wrong then. Uh, and so while the adults all this time, uh, since that time, have been struggling with the term sustainability and what does it mean and it's got so many syllables and it's so complex, how are we going to explain it to people? Third graders, like Alexa, have done a very good job of trying to help us understand what it means. And here's the letter that Alexa wrote to her parents. Dear Mom, Dad, Ethan, and Dylan, I'm writing to you about something we're learning in school. It's called sustainability. Uh, and it means when people get what they want without trashing the world so animals and other people can get what they want and need. Alexa is in a, was in a project of 17 school districts that I worked with some years ago who were taking the lead in educating for sustainability, trying to figure out what the heck it was and, and how we would do it. And, uh, and she was there. I cannot top this as a definition, uh, but I can offer a model and maybe some examples to add some value to it. We see the economy and economic activity and financial capital as completely and utterly dependent on the social and human capital. Communities and legal systems and transportation systems uh, creativity, uh, ingenuity, leadership, and both of those forms of, of capital are dependent on the natural capital upon which all life and all production and all of that activity depends. The farms, the forests, the fisheries, the water, the air, and so forth. And of course, it's all powered by the sun. Um, now to bring it home a little bit to the country and to New Hampshire. What does that actually mean? Some examples can be really useful. So at the national level, over a quarter of a million businesses have signed on to the American Sustainable Business Council to leverage changes, market changes, and policy changes to bring in the new green economy. Locally here, we've got the local food uh, industry emerging. I met Jane at the farmer's market. You've got uh, a corporate sustainable leadership program in the state. 
There are uh, sustainable small business development uh, initiatives, and of course you have a very robust and growing and significant uh, clean green, clean tech industry here. Um, all of that is dependent on the sustainable community initiatives like Sustainable Plymouth and Portsmouth and Keene, higher education activity. Uh, you've got um, University of New Hampshire, Plymouth State, Antioch, the Sustainability Institute, and K-12 activity. We have here the um, Green Ribbon Schools. You have Farm to School, Rethinking School Lunch. And of course, right down the road, we have Quarry Brook, which is a beautiful outdoor learning environment. All of that depends on nature. Um, and apparently, um, Plymouth State is valuing these eco, what we call ecosystem services, working on a project to assign a replacement value. What would it cost if we tried to replace the services we get for free from nature? And I also know that you have a 25-year uh, water quality plan in, in New Hampshire. Very forward thinking. So if we want all of those systems working well together, we like to say all systems are perfectly designed to get the results they get. If we want a healthy and sustainable future, we have to plan for it, we have to design for it, we have to buy and sell, farm, and of course we have to educate for it. Uh, because we have to learn how to live well in our places so that we can contribute to their health and so that they can sustain us. We begin with the learner. Now, of course, the learner in, in K-12 schools, of course, it's the students, but it's also all of us and the, the parents and families of the students. And the individual learners are nested inside classrooms of learners, of young people and adults learning together. And they're nested inside learning organizations, whole schools that are learning and changing uh, in real time over time. And those uh, schools that learn are nested inside physical plants with food and transportation and energy and buildings and schoolyards. And all of that is nested inside communities that learn. So we think schools and communities that learn uh, is the, the most important leverage for moving toward the future we want. Um, I've brought some stories with you so you can see how some of that works uh, in the real world. You've heard a little bit from a third grader. Um, I want to tell you a story about Compass Charter School in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Brooke and Michelle and Todd are young people who were educators, and they started a new school. We're in our first year of this little elementary charter school, K-5. to they took a year odyssey, as they call it, to travel all over the country to look to best practices, effective practices, so that they really could create the 21st century school. Um, and I want to show you a little diagram of the teachers. This is now the summer before the school opened. And the school is committed to educating for sustainability. And it began with a K-1 cohort. And the teachers chose two of our core content areas, responsible local and global citizenship and inventing and affecting the future. Uh, the responsible citizenship is all about understanding our rights and responsibilities as democratic uh, citizens and learning how to lead and participate in our democracy. As it turns out, we don't actually teach democratic participation in most places in the US, which I find um, quite amazing, actually. Uh, so we don't think that's a good idea. We think it's a very good idea to educate uh, young people about civic engagement and participation. The other one they chose was uh, Inventing and Affecting the Future. It's all about envisioning and imagining, tapping our passions, um, persevering, never giving up, never giving up, never giving up, taking risks, doing things we've never done before, and turning problems into opportunities to create value. So those were the first two that they chose. And of course, these kids are five and six years old. And you should see them. It's only May. Uh, you should see those kids uh, negotiating the places and things we share that we're all responsible for and we all depend on. Uh, it's, a, it's pretty amazing. I invite you all to come and visit. The next story I'm going to tell you is a story of a Hawaiian school, an independent school, 
Um, this one was founded in the 1800s by Princess um, Pauahi, and it, she wanted a school for students of Hawaiian ancestry. And so it's been there a long time, quite a diverse group of kids, high achievers, uh, uh, achievers that are working their way up, a lot of kids that are orphans, a lot of kids from other islands. Um, and the teachers, it's a seven and eight school, middle school, I have been working in interdisciplinary teams to educate for sustainability. And some of them chose biomimicry to teach to the students. Now biomimicry is a science in which we look to solve human problems by looking to see the way nature solved problems and applying that to the problems that we're trying to solve. So this, Honua Ike Loa, which English translation, wise world, is a building. This building is solving the problem of the fact that we do not build in ways that are helpful and useful and healthy for people and the environment. That is the problem that the kids chose to solve. So if I go left to right, you see down at the bottom, you've got living uh, roofs. So it's an edible roof and a living roof that cleans the air and cleans water and produces food, will make you lunch, literally. Um, the, the concrete is self-healing mimicking the way muscles self-heal. We have solar energy, and then we have water coming up that mimics the capillary action. The kids taught me all of this, so I'm going to try to do them justice and make sure I remember everything they taught me. Um, it mimics the capillary action of the la'au tree so that it pulls water up um, and, and, um, and keeps the water circulating throughout the system. So that was one of the projects that they worked on. These are seventh graders. This is I Ho'oma'e Ma'e Ka'aila. And roughly translated, it is the cleansing power of aloha is soothing and healing. And the problem they were trying to solve is oil spills and the destruction of ocean sea life. And so they mimicked the pelican, starting again from left to right. The pelican and the sucker fish are the, um, the, uh, the design for the vacuums. They run on, it runs on the oil that it collects. And in case it runs out of oil, it's got a backup system that runs on solar. The engine is modeled after the frog heart because the frog heart divides materials into different sections and the machine needs to know what's what coming in. Um, and it's propelled by water coming out and by and modeling a humpback whale um, uh, to keep it moving. And then the, um, the honeycomb, the weight and the strength ratio, they, they were so careful to make sure I got it right, um, work to allow the machine to go down very deep into the water. I hope I got that right for them. And this is the limu weli, which is um, the sea urchin and seaweed. And this one is solving the problem of uh, invasive species in the ocean. And so they've modeled, as you can see, the octopus and the cuttlefish, because they can camouflage themselves and also detect color. So they can sort out what's the invasive species and what isn't the invasive species. And, um, and then we've got it all run by hydroelectric power. And uh, it's, it's a pretty awesome, awesome design. Um, they're waiting for a patent at the moment. This is now Kellum High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Kellum is a new building. Uh, it's got about 1,800 students, 1,850 students. This is the garden. There are actually three gardens in Kellum High School. One is a edible garden, one is a central garden, and one is a marsh habitat. Um, the edible garden is good for um, eating, obviously. They use it for lunch. They study in it. They have classes in it. Central garden has a vertical garden. They have a lab and a greenhouse. And then the marsh actually um, acts like a marsh because it's designed to process the water and, and especially during heavy rainstorms, um, make sure that the um, water gets put back into the ground. So it's beautifully designed as a landscape as well as a study uh, location. 
This is the whole building of Kellum High School. It's a silver LEED certified. It cost exactly the same amount as all the other buildings um, uh, before it that were not um, green buildings or LEED certified. And, um, and it will save money over time. And it was actually designed by students and teachers, what a concept. Uh, in six learning communities so that interdisciplinary teams could work together. Um, and the, the sustainability officer, Tim Cole, for the district, who is an ex-Navy SEAL, he says, oh, sustainability is the kind of challenge we really like as, as SEALs. He said, you know, this to me a challenge is just intriguing. So he's not daunted by the task at all of moving toward a sustainable future. Uh, so where do we begin? Well, of course, you begin where you can. We begin where there are favorable conditions. So you see over there on the left, the, er the innovators and the early adopters. Every sector that's moving towards sustainability is almost at tipping point, almost at critical mass. And the early adopters that I work with are those leaders, the kids and the teachers and the administrators that are, and the community leaders that are re ready to educate for a sustainable future. Our job is to make the results of our work visible, desirable, and doable for the early majority. They're not against it, but they're not going to be the first on their block to take it up. Once they're interested in doing it and they are able to move forward, then the late majority comes on. And as for the laggards, um, a problem is a solution in the wrong place. So if they don't want to change, they can help us the opportunity there is that they can help us preserve what needs to be preserved while, we need, while we're changing what needs to be changed. So there's always an opportunity. I love this t-shirt. This is my husband's t-shirt. Um, it reminds me that a, uh, the more we think about the problem, the more we reinforce the thinking that causes the problem. So it doesn't really work. So think of ETA. Envision the future we want. Think about our thinking so that we continually improve it and address more than one problem at a time um, and minimize the creation of new problems. So what's my recommendation? Teach and learn for the future we want. It's a better idea. <laughs>